All right, so what I'm about to read, you can see how this applies to church, which is cursy, and you can see how it applies to masons. So according to the Egyptian version of the myth, Osiris, Serapis, the son of gods, was treacherously murdered and his limbs scattered abroad by his brother Seth, Typhon. Osiris's wife and sister Isis then began a far-ranging search for the remains aided by the dog god Anubis. She was eventually successful. Osiris was restored as lord of the underworld, and Seth was defeated in a combat with Horus, son of Isis and Osiris. From the from this mythic base grew the great mysteries of Isis, commemorating the climactic moments of her search and discovery, as in the parallel case of Demeter's search and discovery of her daughter per Persephone, Perse Persephone, the entire dramatic complex of myth and cult was a token of rebirth for the initiate. And even though the theological center of the myth would seem to be Osiris, the focus of the cult and the primary object of religious veneration was, as it had been from the primitive beginnings, the female figure Isis, the queen of heaven, Sirius the star. The Greek centers, particularly Corinth, continued to honor Isis and her consort well into late antiquity, but the clearest indications of the power of this Egyptian cult can be seen in Roman circles. The to Ptolemaic connection with Sicily, and that just means Ptolemy. The Ptolemaic connection with Sicily introduced Serapis there in the third century. From Sicily, the cult spread northward through the Hellenized cities in southern Italy. And by BC 150, Isis was a commanding religious figure at Pompeii. A theasos of her priests was instituted at Rome during the time of Sulla. Shortly thereafter, a pattern of Roman resistance began to develop. Not only were the mysteries offensive to Roman religious and moral susceptibilities, they were the cult of a hostile political power as well. On a number of occasions, the mysteries were legally prescribed and the temples of Isis torn down. In AD 19, under Tiberius, there was, in addition, a resounding scandal involving the Isaic priesthood and wholesale Deportations followed, so the Isis priesthood. This was the last serious difficulty. Egypt was by then a Roman province, and the political associations of the cult had consequently disappeared. From Claudius onward, Isis was supreme among the alien gods who had gained a foothold in the empire. Caligula, Domitian, and Caracalla gave her magnificent temples at the heart of Rome. There were 42 serapiums, so for Serapis at Alexandria alone, and each was celebrated the daily liturgy in honor of Isis. That's where church gets their liturgies from. It's pagan. Church is pagan. It's not the same as the ecclesia, the called out assembly before Jesus Christ. Other gods might have occasional feast days in the Roman fasti, but Isis was honored every day in her temples. It is not difficult to understand the appeal of Isis. Constantly before the eye of the believer, she was the protected and celebrated object of a highly organized cult apparatus that had all the appearances of a church. The complex upper and lower priesthoods were almost certainly Egyptian-dominated. They involved an at least occasional reading of hieroglyphs, though there is some evidence that the Romans attempted to take control of such a powerful institution. So take control of the church, right? There was, too, an idealized code of behavior that had progressed far beyond what had earlier been simply ritual purity to a genuine moral innocence involving chastity and abstinence. Finally, Isis enjoyed an attractive ritual uh, adorned by hymns, litanies, and an impressive pictorial decor. The public rituals in honor of Isis took place annually between October 26th and November 3rd. When the great myth of the Seeking and the finding of Osiris was dramatized with moving splendor. There were, as well, as well lesser feasts like the sailing of Isis on March 5th. All the holy days were celebrated with public processions in which the images of the Egyptian gods were carried about the city. Far more secret were the initiation ceremonies proper. So, as I wrote up here, Masons, fortunately, they are described in some detail. The central core is, of course, suppressed. Uh, they don't know about the central core. In the Metamorphoses of the second century Latin author Apuleius, whose, whose hero Lucius is initiated into the 
is Isaiah Mysteries, so Is Isis Mysteries, and it has to do with Sirius the Dog Star. So um, I'm going to read this real quick. Isaiah artistic piety is fully represented at Pompeii. A frequent motif was that of Isis and her infant son, Harpocrates, as Madonna and child in postures providing clear antecedents to later Christian treatments of the same theme. The litanies, too, in which Isis proclaims her own all-embracing claims of veneration or in which the adept recited her many titles must have provided attractive suggestions for the later Marian liturgies. Marian. So, Mary, like the way they worship the Virgin Mary in um, Roman Catholic circles, even though she wasn't a virgin after she had Jesus because she, Jesus had brothers and sisters. So it says the initiation began with a ritual washing like the church, which we know the church isn't the same as the ecclesia, a ritual washing and a protracted fast. Once this was completed, Lucius came to the Isium toward evening. He was given gifts and the uninitiated withdrew. The ceremonies lasted through the night. I drew near the confines of death. I was carried through the elements and returned to earth again. I saw the sun shining brightly. I saw the gods above and below face to face, and in the morning clothed in ceremonial garb, with a torch in his hand and a crown upon his head, Lucius reemerged to celebrate the happy day of his rebirth. All right, so that's what I wanted to share with you from that page. And then over here, it talks more about, it says, Aristotide's belief in Asclepius was personal and immediate, supported by a number of visions and epiphanies of the God to whom he attributed all the skill and talent that he possessed. But this intimate relationship with one God did not inhibit his acceptance of the syncretism of the times. The half-Egyptian Serapis appeared to Aristotides at the side of Asclepius, and he composed hymns to Zeus, Dionysius, Athena, and others of the traditional Olympians. They were no longer, however, clearly distinguished individuals. The philosophically inspired henotheism had worked its effects on Aristotides too. All the gods are one. So we see here the comparison between Serapis and Asclepius. All right, over here, we see that it talks about... Um, so, mm. the former is the imperfect but useful means of sanctification for the masses and capable of the contemplative prayer of the philosopher. The, the later is the work of the evil demons who are the source of physical and moral evil for man frequently in disguise of the benevolent gods and who, from a liturgical point of view, delight in blood and flesh offering. They have, moreover, a leader, a type of Iranian prince of darkness who aspired to be the high god. So, periphery at one point identifies the chief of the evil, Deomont of Serapis. It is more likely the shadow of Ariman at work, probably as seen through Jewish or Christian eyes, for whom Satan was already a standard piece of cosmic furniture. So this is like the Roman Catholic mass that permeated all the Protestant reformers and the, the Reformation because they never got rid of that blood and flesh ritual, which is a um, corruption of Jesus' words in John 6 when he says, the, the, his flesh he'll give to, for the life of the world. So that's um, speaking of spiritual things, not eating literal blood and flesh. And they, they actually believe through transubstantiation that the cracker and grape juice become literal blood and flesh. So you see how wicked that is just through what it's saying right there. So let me see. Does it say anything else here? Mm, okay, I don't see anything right here. But Okay, so right here it says, Labanius' pro protestations had little effect in the partisan atmosphere of the late 4th century in AD 391. Theodice Theodosius enacted, perhaps under pressure from the militant Ambrose, the first general edict forbidding sacrifice and closing the temples throughout the empire. And he followed it in the next year with a law that made even private non-Christian cultists illegal. 
This was the official attitude expressed through the normal legal channels, but even earlier crowds in the cities and the countryside took matters into their own hands and destroyed pagan temples, frequently with a great deal of bloodshed since the temples also had their defenders. Probably the most spectacular of these incidents was the destruction, sometime about A.D. 390, of the great temple of Serapis in Alexandria. For the Egyptians, it seemed like the end of an era, and indeed it was, and in more senses than one, along with the temple, the crowds put to the torch the great library that had been gathered there since the days of the first Ptolemy. So they burned the library of Alexandria. And I put right here, I put, um, so you should investigate the science of the mob. And I put clearly not actions taken by true Christians because a true follower of Christ is not allowed to do those kinds of violent things that are spoken of there. So, all right, so. Uh, the way that I got to these studies and both of these books, this one right here, Harvest of Hellenism. So I just went to the index and I looked up Serapis and then I looked up the pages and read through them and circled and did a little um, little notes on the side of what they were talking about. So the same here with um, this book right here, um, which is like from the ancient East by Adolf Deisman. It says... Um, Serapis, and it gives the page number. So you just go to the index, and the index will help you find your way. So, all right. Um, I appreciate y'all taking time to watch, and take it easy. All right, bye.